do you think it's conceivable that the UK would be able to rejoin the EU without a referendum? I mean, would our partners or potential partners be satisfied by a decision purely by a government? Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust, and I'm talking once again to Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, about developments in the UK relating to Brexit. Brendan, there have been a number of quite intriguing developments commenting on the current position of the UK in relation to uh, whether it can rejoin the European Union at some stage. The first thing that caught my attention was the remark by Peter Mandelson saying that it was a joke to even contemplate uh, the UK rejoining. What do you make of that? Well, it's a Stalmerite orthodoxy at the moment that you should talk as little as possible about Europe and even less about the possibility of rejoining. Um, Mandelson wanted to associate himself with that orthodoxy. Uh, I think his contribution to the debate was to say that it's naive and unrealistic and uh, um, exotically um, ludicrous uh, even to talk about rejoining. Well, uh, one of the arguments he put forward was that the EU isn't at all interested in the United Kingdom rejoining. It's interesting that there he's attempting to shift the responsibility to the other side rather than to the, the British side. Uh, I think it's untrue that the United, that the European Union is, is hostile or even indifferent to the idea of the United Kingdom rejoining. And I think the EU would be very pleased if the United Kingdom wanted to rejoin. But the United Kingdom would have to understand that there's a, a lot of work to be done from the UK side in, in order to build up trust, which has been um, destroyed and, and wantonly thrown away uh, over the past eight years. A lot of pro-Europeans in Britain are placing great hopes on a Labour government, which now seems uh, highly likely, if not in, inevitable, um, following the next election. Do you feel that these remarks by Peter Mandelson reveal that those hopes may be misplaced? I think there are barriers to those hopes being realised, which um, shouldn't be underestimated. And M Mandelson's remarks are, are, are part of that um, rhetoric that the Labour Party is developing. Uh, Rachel Reeves recently talked about the way in which uh, attempting to get closer to the European Union under a new Labour government uh, would be uh, disorienting and uh, disruptive for British uh, industry. It's part of the narrative that the Labour Party are trying to develop, that they are the party of economic stability in contrast to the feckless Conservatives. Well, I think that what Reeves, um, who was never a great enthusiast for the European Union, um, is saying is, is the opposite of the truth. Uh, Brexit is of its nature a disruptive force. It's something which has trashed 50 years of economic and political stability for the United Kingdom within the European Union. Uh, and there are always going to be new manifestations coming forward um, of how Brexit is a disruptive force. It's only really when Brexit is reversed that, that, that stability will be restored to the British economy. But do you think that uh, economic events will force a Labour government, regardless of these remarks and this position, uh, into a more pro-European uh, posture? I think that's uh, entirely possible. I, I, I think that... Uh, for a year or so, um, the government will be stuck with its, um, its present uh, unenthusiastic, even soft Eurosceptic rhetoric. Um, but then uh, economic and political events um, may well force it to look for a, for a new narrative particularly if it hasn't been able to show um, the economic um, benefits and advantages that it's been claiming for itself in in, uh, in its next um, term in government. Um, Europe might be, be a, an answer to, to that, that the Labour maiden's prayer. Uh, it'll be politically difficult, but I, I think it's, it, it's one of the great unresolved questions of present British politics. Will halfway through its next its first term in office, um, the Labour Party pivot in a more pro-European direction, and I think it's entirely possible that that will happen. Not because at the moment Starmer or his close associates want it to happen, but because uh, events may force them in that direction. But these events uh, you see as being primarily economic realities, the problem of finding growth, or, or are they wider political ones or geopolitical ones related to developments vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia or the United States? Or, or... Yes, I, I think it's certainly true that uh, if there were 
um, uh, a Trump presidency, uh, then that's something which uh, objectively would force both militarily and economically and politically uh, the United Kingdom much closer to the European Union. And, and quite a lot of these uh, hesitations and um, Mandelsonian reticences um, would be, be overtaken by, by events, not just economic, as you say. Of course, I suppose part of this picture will be what position the uh, opposition to a Labour government takes uh, towards the European Union uh, following the next general election, uh, particularly in circumstances in which uh, the Conservatives suffer a very major defeat and go through uh, a process of uh, internal turmoil over their future position. And here we've had some intervention from a, a person perhaps as uh, compromised reputationally on the Conservative side, as Peter Mandelson has been on the Labour side, namely Michael Gove in a recent interview. What do you make of his remarks? I agree. It's very important for where the Labour Party ends up on Europe in a couple of years' time, um, what happens to the Conservative Party over the next couple of years. Uh, I think it's entirely possible that they'll suffer a crushing defeat and that the party will then split. Um, a, a part of it uh, associating itself with reform um, and a, a middle ground which may attempt to form a, a regional party, say in the southeast, say in London, or, or may become to be associated with the Liberal Democrats. Um, if that's so, then it might be easier for the, um, for the Labour Party to move in a more pro-EU direction. But the remarks from Grove, Gove were, were quite extraordinary. Um, we now find that uh, he was never particularly in favour of a referendum anyway. He thought it might be divisive. Um, and courageously, he's admitted that the person who took the decision was David Cameron. Um, and he was against it at the time. Uh, learning from, through suffering is what the Greek tragedians used to talk about. Well, the learning is goes because he says that no future prime minister should ever engage in a referendum on a controversial subject. But the suffering, I'm afraid, is is, is the UK's. Uh, it may be when he says in this interview that he was never agitating for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union, um, although he was a Eurosceptic, he's ca carrying out the first very tentative um, steps um, in distancing himself from Brexit. Um, that, that may be a, a, an interesting straw in the wind. I mean, it's not clear, though, that what Gove is telling us is actually the truth of the matter, because he was always a very convinced uh... Uh, Brexiteer, and he knew that the only way in which Cameron could um, uh, would deliver Brexit in any form would be by calling a referendum. Well, and he but... encouraged Cameron to call a referendum by saying that he would support him in the event of that referendum in, in favour of the Remain cause, which he then did the opposite. Well, the present position of, of Michael Gove is that referendums are a very bad way to settle major political questions. He thinks that governments should have um, a commitment in a manifesto to carry something out. And if they then win a, uh, a, an election, they're entitled to do so. Presumably, if in, 19, in 2029, the Labour Party advocated rejoining the European Union or hold it or in, in its manifesto, um, he'd go along with that and find that perfectly acceptable that the Labour government should take us back into the European Union uh, after winning a, a, an election victory. But do you think it's conceivable that the UK would be able to rejoin the EU without a referendum? I mean, would our partners or potential partners be satisfied by a decision purely by a government? Uh, that's a very, very reasonable question. Um, at the moment, these things are, are, are so much in the realm of speculation that you can only look at possibilities. Uh, it might well be uh, that one of the things that our partners would want com convincing about uh, is the solidity of the decision to re-enter the European Union. And, and that might, might take time. Um, but it's not going to happen unless you have political leaders advocating for that rejoin position. One of the dishonest things which is sometimes said, not just by Labour, but by other supposedly pro-EU parties, is that nobody's talking about rejoining. Well, the reason why nobody's talking about rejoining, other than when they're asked in opinion polls, is, is that their political leaders are, are so, um, are, are so mealy-mouthed on the subject, so reluctant to advocate the obvious solution to the problems that Brexit causes. The reason why our partners might wish to see a referendum is because clearly they would require the assurance that there is support right across the political spectrum from, from left to right in favour of rejoining. 
And so therefore the position taken by um, the Conservative Party, if, if it's remade following this election, um, it becomes very important. We've seen some indications that uh, Conservatives could be considering uh, a total reversal of position on, on the EU. I mean, we've had an article, for example, um, in in the uh, the Daily Telegraph by one of their leader writers advocating um, a, a rethink along these lines. Is this just a, a sort of a, a flash in the pan or, or a, a bit of uh, clickbait, or or does it indicate the possibility that among conservative opinion there could be a reversal of thinking on on our membership of the EU? I think the question is not just how, how the Conservative Party positions itself on Europe over the next five years, but the question of, uh, of how big and how significant a political force that Conservative Party is. Because if it's true that um, a, a portion of the present Conservative Party, which finds, by the way, Rishi Sunak too left wing, we know from opinion polling, uh, allies itself with the Reform Party, uh, then that might be a, a party which would, would score 20, 22, 23 percent in, in the polls. Um, but it would run the risk of, of being electorally insignificant under our first past the post system. So we have to ask ourselves not merely where the Conservative Party will stand, but how important it will be in the possibly remade um, uh, framework of, of British politics in the next um, five or, or six years. Um, as far as the article was concerned, it was a, it was a surprise, um, but uh, I don't think it reflects yet uh, any significant change in in general orthodox conservative opinion. Um, the argument that was being made was rather a niche one. It was the one that said that um, since uh, the, the government and um, political opinion in the United Kingdom wasn't prepared to accept a, a deregulated post-Brexit Britain, um, then it made sense to go back to the warm embrace of the European Union. Some of this was said tongue in cheek, but but it did reflect what we've we've discussed before that the one part of the Brexit coalition was the Singapore on Thames folks, as they say, the MAGA folks, the people who thought that the way to um, uh, take advantage of leaving the European Union was to introduce a, a radical program of deregulation and privatization. Now that was never politically saleable to the United Kingdom, um, and it's the reason why the, these people were kept under wraps during during the referendum period. I think that they have realized, or many of them have realized, um, that it's politically a, a non-starter in the United Kingdom. And, and some of them draw the conclusion or may draw the conclusion uh, that uh, a return to the European Union is is envisageable um, if it, it's not going to lead, if Brexit is not going to lead to this deregulation that they want. Uh, I think there may have been another um, uh, agenda uh, uh, at work um, behind this particular article. There may have been the invitation to some people to consider, if you want to save Brexit, you've got to go down the deregulatory path. Um, and perhaps that might be the beginnings of an argument for saying that uh, a trust to or, or someone like Liz Trust um, ought to be the next leader of the Conservative Party. There were two pillars, I suppose, of the right wings so-called right-wing uh, uh, case for Brexit. Uh, and one was deregulation. One was uh, imitating essentially the economy of the United States far more than uh, a European models. Uh, and the other was opposition to immigration. Of course, these two don't entirely mesh with each other. And that was one of the problems underlying um, the failure of, of uh, the current uh, conservative government. But is it conceivable that either or both of these pillars could be transformed into a European direction. I mean, if one wants an economy comparable to that of the United States, you need economies of continental scale. And that's only really feasible within a much more integrated uh, European Union market. And that's certainly what the right in, in continental Europe is now increasingly moving towards, away from its opposition to uh, European integration in favour of a form of European integration that would be um, essentially on a right-wing agenda. And immigration too, uh, because it raises issues of identity, uh, could also conceivably take a, a European turn, could it not? Because 
After all, there is the question of to what extent this idea of global Britain, as opposed to European Britain, reflected in current patterns of immigration, um, is actually really what uh, the people who voted for Brexit on the basis of opposition to immigration um, were really calling for. I think you're you're quite right that there's a, a a failure to mesh together of those two elements of the of the Brexit coalition. Um, and what I've always found particularly ironic was that um, Mrs. Thatcher uh, was very much in favour of the single market um, as a, a deregulatory mechanism, which which on the whole it was um, very substantially. There were some elements of sovereignty sharing which she didn't like, and that's why she she took again um, the single market. But I can see the entire logic uh, of those uh, in the con on the continent, and perhaps increasingly in the Conservative Party, uh, who think that the the authentic um, uh, deregulatory agenda can best be pursued at the, the European level. Uh, and of course, uh, migration within the European Union, a free market in, in labour, uh, is an important component of that. Uh, I think it's very incipient and uh, ill-formed at the moment, this thinking within the Conservative Party. But we may look back in a few years' time and say that this particular article um, was a, a precursor um, of a wider reassessment of the way in which perhaps a, um, a, a market liberal Conservative Party, um, one interested in European identity, can find its home within the European Union. But in the meantime, we're faced with the extraordinary situation that uh, talking about um, Brexit and le let alone talking about any possibility of reversing Brexit is a total taboo in British politics right across the spectrum. We, we have uh, a general election coming in which the debate about the, the deepest issues which face the country uh, is actually excluded. And I'm reminded of uh, a commentary made on uh, the decline of the Spanish Empire um, in the 18th century, that uh, it, the, it was observed um, by the Marquis de Pomba, who was the, the Portuguese statement, that all problems uh, had, that were really serious had become impossible to discuss, and that this was a mark of a decadent society. One feels that that observation is becoming relevant for the UK, sadly. Uh, it couldn't be uh, an objection hurled at the Federal Trust and ourselves. We spend a great deal of time talking about Brexit. But I think it's important that, that people like ourselves who, who do think Brexit and its reversal is important should not be deterred by sneers from, from Peter Mandelson. Uh, I'm rather encouraged by the fact that the debate in this country is so so confused and so murky on Brexit. There are so many cross currents in it. Um, I, I think it, it's entirely possible that in two or three years the, the clouds will lift and there'll be a, a, a much more straightforward and uh, realistic view of, of of the disaster that Brexit is um, and the way in which it needs to be, be reversed. Um, eight years after the referendum, there's no sort of possible consensus emerging. And it, it's my view that um, it's only when at least we make moves toward the single market and the, custom, and the customs union that that um, uh, instability can be in some way mitigated. Ironically, one of the things I agree with Cheryl Jacobs about uh, is that at the halfway house of simply being in the single market and the customs union is perhaps an impossible um, factually to achieve, um, and certainly a, a, an unsustainable, a politically unsustainable halfway house. Um, in for a penny, in for a euro would be my motto, and I hope that's um, the consensus that will emerge in two or three years' time. Brendan, thank you very much for this. Um, the Federal Trust will go on and actually debating these matters if no one else is at the moment. I hope you enjoyed this uh, video and we'll follow our other work on the same topic. Thank you.